Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a review of Roadside Picnic slash Stalker, the Tarkovsky film that was based on this book. But it's mainly about this book because I finished reading it a couple of weeks ago and I'm still thinking about it because you can read this book in a few different ways and it's a very interesting book. Half of that is because of who wrote it, when it was written, how it was published. This was written by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, who were two Soviet Union era writers. There was a lot of blocking of this book from the publishers, and not in the way that you might think it is when you hear Soviet Union. You might think, oh, they were like critiquing the communist regime and things like that. They weren't, not necessarily, not explicitly. It was more about how bleak it was and like how unhopeful the book is. <laughs> it was also because this is set potentially in America because there's like mention of states and a city that sounds very American. Although some people think it's in Canada, so who knows. But for me, the way I read it, I felt like this was very much set in America. So there's the idea that would you really want someone publishing a story that's set in another country outside of the Soviet Union? But in a way it does critique capitalism and that way of life. What makes this book so compelling is that it's science fiction and it's about contact with aliens. Like, I love that stuff. It's one of the most fascinating, exciting and enthralling things for me to read about. Because quite often I just sit and ponder, what would happen if suddenly aliens came along? What the hell would we do? So in this, aliens do come along, but they're there for the briefest of moments. And there's an analogy which is why it's called Roadside Picnic. Yeah, so a scientist basically comes up with the idea or the analogy that the visit from these aliens is like a roadside picnic. So he says, imagine a picnic. Imagine a forest, a country road, a meadow. A car pulls off the road into the meadow and unloads young men, bottles, picnic baskets, girls, transistor radios, cameras. A fire is lit, tents are pitched music is played and in the morning they leave the animals birds and insects that were watching the whole night in horror crawl out of their shelters and what do they see an oil spill a gasoline puddle old spark plugs and oil filters strewn about scattered rags burn out bulbs someone has dropped a monkey wrench the wheels have tracked mud from some godforsaken swamp and of course there are the remains of the campfire apple cores candy wrappers tins bottles someone's handkerchief, someone's penknife, old ragged newspapers, coins, wilted flowers from another meadow. I get it, said Noonan, a roadside picnic. Exactly, a picnic by the side of some space road. And you ask me whether they'll come back? And I just thought that was fascinating because essentially there's seven zones around the world where something was fired, aliens landed and then went off somewhere else so it's it's the idea that we are so insignificant that we we didn't even come onto their radar they didn't even pay us any attention and a lot of people like someone in the book and potentially a lot of people would have problems with that they would think that there has to be more of a reason for aliens to come to us but obviously that's egotistical and then someone says here so-called serious xenologists try to justify interpretations that are much more respectable and flattering to human vanity we need to have meaning because otherwise if we don't have meaning what's the point so yeah like the idea that these zones were literally just aliens plopping in and then zooming off somewhere else and then the kind of destruction that they leave behind notes have been made that not necessarily after the book but the movie which was stalker which i think it was like nine or six years before Chernobyl happened. And a lot of people were likening that whole toxic sort of zones to the Chernobyl incident. And then interestingly, you did have like people that would go into the radioactive areas of Chernobyl. They would call themselves stalkers, which is what the people that go into the zones in this are called. 
I just thought that was like fascinating and how it's like seeped into societal conscious. But yeah, essentially, this is going to be a very disjointed review, I can just tell already. The, the basis of the story is about a guy called Red Shuart, and he is kind of like, he's a bit of a misfit. It says it on the back, he's a bit of a misfit. He goes into these zones because there's riches to be had, there's devices, there's weird stuff that we can't make sense of, but he can bring it back and then sell it on the black market to make a fortune. There's repercussions, so he does get thrown in prison in a couple of times because he's doing it illegally and also his daughter which is so bizarre in this because he's been into the zone having a child um they come out different to other children um so he calls his daughter the monkey because she basically has some sort of mutation that her whole body is covered in fur but then over time i'm pretty sure she like slowly becomes more ape-like and it's just so weird there's other weird stuff that happens because of these zones, like dead people return to life, but more of like just sort of revenants. So they're just like wandering around and then they'll return to their family and then they'll just sit there and they might like have a drink or share a meal, but they can't really do much. So there's a lot of inexplicable things that happen around these zones, but naturally it's exploited. But it's interesting the way they talk about the exploitation in this book. Because remember, we're in America, so let's find a passage. So yeah, there's construction. The Institute's putting up three new buildings. Um, where did that go? Yeah, so like in, in the beginning, there was almost like they knew that they had to regulate to stop things but then greed gets in the way so it says here the speeches that were made the bills that were proposed and now you can't even remember how all this unanimous steely resolve suddenly evaporated into thin air on the one hand we were we are forced to admit on the other we can't dispute and it all seems to have started when the stalkers brought the first space cells out of the zone the batteries yes i think that's really how it started especially when it was discovered that space cells multiply it turned out that the saw wasn't such a saw. Maybe it wasn't a saw at all, but instead a treasure trove. And now no one has a clue what it is. A saw, a treasure trove, an evil temptation, Pandora's box, a monster, a demon. We're using it bit by bit. But yeah, like then it becomes almost a tourist attraction. Like someone does tours around it there's like hotels springing out loads of bars and things like that so it's just like it's capitalism cashing in on this sort of gold mine it's almost like the the gold rush and there's like some really awful stuff that happens i don't want to reveal too much but there's substances that get brought back that then kill loads of people loads of people die in it purely because it's so dangerous to go into these places and stalkers basically map out a route through this weird surreal zone and often the markers are oh don't go there because blah 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 died there and it's just crazy but yeah so you've got the juxtaposition in this which i think is like one of the biggest critiques on capitalism within the book and then almost as a, a parallel is the virtuosity of communism um so let me just find that example so think about what I just said about like exploitation and like it's a gold mine, treasure trove, Pandora's box and all that. Now, in Russia, they've never even heard of stalkers. Over there, they really have an empty belt around the zone, a hundred miles wide, no one around, none of these stinking tourists and no Burbridges. Burbridge is like his nickname is the Vulture because he really, really, like, does exploit the zone. And I thought it was interesting, like, the, the fact that they used a vulture. It just gives you, like, a really good image of someone that just is morally bankrupt. And I made, like, this weird, pretentious um, remark to my sister when I was reading this, and I said it's almost like the vulture is the, the antithesis of the American ideal. Like, their symbol of America is the eagle. It's almost like a noble, proud, but dangerous bird, whereas a vulture is like the bastardization of the symbol of America. The eagle is expectation, it's what they think they are, but potentially they're all vultures. <laughs> Capitalism, eh? Yeah, so I, d I don't know whether that's like me just being weird and over reading into something, but I just thought the idea that potentially someone being called a vulture is a bastardization of the symbol of America. 
who knows? They really have an empty belt around the zone, a hundred miles wide, no one around, none of these stinking tourists and no bird bridges. It's the idea that they're virtuous in the exploitation. They don't exploit it because they've got no interest. Whereas America, it's like, what can we do with this? How can we benefit from this? How can we turn everything into a money-making opportunity? It's greed times 100. But yeah, like, this is told over several years and it sort of charts the idea of this guy, Red, just going through the motions. He doesn't really know what to do with his life, but because of his family, he has to fall even deeper into stalking. And then at some point, Burbridge, the vulture, on one of their expeditions, falls into some hell slime, burns his legs off because that happens and then speaks of a magical, almost, device called the Sphere, which can grant people their wishes. And so this is where Stalker the movie actually comes in, because all up to this point, they're completely unrelated. None of what happens in Stalker has happened for most of the book. It's literally the last section of this book that influenced Tarkovsky's film. And I think it's interesting because Arkady and Boris Strugatsky also wrote the script. So it was like taking the DNA of their story and perhaps one of the most compelling parts of it, the idea of wishing for something, but then the pressure of getting the wish right and just the implications of having something that could potentially give you your wildest dreams, what that would do to the psychology of a person. So that's really where Stalker takes from the original material. And instead of it being a sphere, it's a room in Stalker. The film is very mysterious. It's very beautifully shot. The way outside the zone, it's all like sepia tones because it's just drudgery, boring. And then when they go into the zone, it's all in this vivid greens, beautiful idyllic. So it's almost like feeding into the almost addiction that Red has in this of needing to be in the zone. You could say the same for like gambling and things like that. It's the rush. It's the feeling of having purpose. So that's like very beautifully displayed in the movie. But another interesting thing is the monkey in the book isn't in the the film, but the stalker's daughter does have like telekinesis in the film. And I'm pretty sure there's no mention of aliens in the movie, which is interesting. But yeah, back to the book. I think one of the most compelling parts is is the ending. And I, I, I read it and I was just like, whoa, okay. Because it just ends abruptly. But it's, it's the idea of wishes and Red sacrifices a guy to be able to use the globe thing, the sphere, because that's just how it works. Again, it, it's almost like exploitation how far would you go for your wish to come true how selfish will you be at the final like hurdle and he also then has a bit of a mental break read at the moment that he's making this wish because he then realizes yeah that it's like just a wonderful passage and then he panics almost and he talks about oh maybe i'll get revenge on all the people that wronged me and what man is born for i have no idea he's born that's all scrapes by those best he can let us all be healthy and let them all go to hell. My lord, it's a mess, a mess. My entire life I've been at war with Captain Quarterblood. But how do I stop being a stalker when I have a family to feed? Get a job? And I don't want to work for you. Your work makes me want to puke, you understand? If a man has a job, then he's always working for someone else. He's a slave, nothing more. And I've always wanted to be my own boss, my own man, so that I don't have to give a damn about anyone else, about their gloom and their boredom. And he was no longer trying to think, he just kept repeating to himself in despair like a prayer. I'm an animal, you can see that I'm an animal. I have no words, they haven't taught me the words. I don't know how to think. Those bastards didn't let me learn how to think. But if you really are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-understanding, figure it out, look into my soul. I know everything you need is in there. It has to be, because I've never sold my soul to anyone. It's mine, it's human. Figure out yourself what I want, because I know it can't be bad. The hell with it all. I just can't think of a thing other than those words of his. Happiness, free for everyone, and let no one be forgotten. And that's how it ends. So then, it's interesting the way he says, I don't know how to think. Those bastards didn't let me learn how to think. 
you could see that as like censorship and the way that the USSR, the Soviet Union worked, it's almost like a hive mind of the same thought pattern. So in a way you could see that as a scathing look at the the regime. But it, it's also the idea that happiness for free for everyone and let no one be forgotten. They're not even his own words. So at the end, when he's really thinking of something, he can't think of something for himself. He takes someone else's wish. And then it, it kind of makes you think, like, what would I wish for if I could make a wish to something that potentially could grant something? And I think a lot of us potentially would actually do something for the good of other people. Which, I guess, is a nice thought. But it's just almost like he's raving at the end. Like, he's gone a bit mental. And it's, it's no surprise. You're going through this deadly place. Someone dies right before your eyes. And then you're like, oh shit, now it's my turn. What do I even ask for? And it's, it's almost like the idea that deep down within you, you know what you want. But you don't have the power to express it. And I just thought that was fascinating. I feel like I need to reread this again because it's the kind of book that there's just so much going on. So much going on when you're reading it. You could unpack it and I I like I, I made a few underlines and things like that. But I just I feel like I need to reread it to sort of delve deeper into it. Maybe look at a bit of theory. I probably should like read the foreword by her Majesty Ursula K. Le Guin, the queen of science fiction. But I didn't, because I always find like, sometimes I start reading forwards and then it almost then gives me an impression on the book before I've even started it so I can't formulate my own thoughts. And then can I even have any thoughts? <laughs> because they haven't taught me the words. I don't know how to think. But yeah, are we all programmed to think a certain way by society? And in a way, yes. So like, do we even have the thoughts, the words to formulate our own desires? Or are we just beholden to the regime that we're born into, whether it is socialism, communism, democracy, capitalism and all those things? And I feel like, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like, I, I read on the internet, I'll put the link to the article down below, but someone read this as sort of an analogy or a a metaphor for the Berlin Wall and saying like the zones are like Berlin where it's like divided between the Allied powers and the USSR. Also the idea that the contraband that they take from one zone and out into the world could be an idea of like the contraband that was shifted from west to east Berlin and things like that. I, w I would like to say like I feel like that's just a bit of an op oversimplification and it would kind of like hurt me a little bit that it wasn't more of a sci-fi concept. But yeah I would say this is like a philosophical sci-fi. It's a book to make you think and to challenge your thoughts and maybe your arrogance around humanity's place in the world, whether happiness or utopia can really exist. And potentially, I don't really know what else to say. I, I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. I gave it five out of five stars because it just, I don't know, like it just really got to me. Kind of like how the film did. How that, again, goes on the idea that making a wish, is that too powerful? Could your wish then turn someone else's life around? Like, can you wield such overwhelming power? And then in a way, you could see this as just a study on power and how regimes enforce things upon people and how power corrupts and it, yeah, stuff like that. I don't know, like, I feel like I've kind of just only dug onto the surface of this which is exciting in a way because you know that you're going to be able to mine some more from it at a later point but yeah I definitely recommend if you haven't read this or you've never heard of it definitely read it because it will just make you think and sort of challenge the way you see the world perhaps yeah like it's just a very interesting and introspective look at life humanity and all of the above. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say actually other than read this, watch the movie, compare both of them. This is like kind of like book versus movie video but 
both of them stand on their own as exceptional pieces of work. Explore both of them. It's a draw, it's a tie. Let me know in the comments section if you've read Roadside Picnic, what you think of it, how you read it, what you got from it. Let me know if you think I'm onto something with some of the things I've said. If not, tell me I'm completely wrong. I don't really care. I think it's fun when people tell you that your point of view is wrong because then it creates a, a debate love a good debate myself. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and I guess I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>